Most parents who love their children want them to eventually find love when they grow up. They want their sons or daughters to meet someone who will love and cherish them and treat them with all the kindness and love that they themselves have for them. At the beginning of the 20th century in the very early years around 1900, Grace Brown's own mother probably had those same hopes for her spunky and fun-loving daughter. Grace was born in 1886 and had just turned 18 when she took a job at the Gillette Petticoat Factory in New York. Although she was the fifth of nine children, she had a way of standing out. She had received the nickname, Billy, because one of her favorite songs that she would love to sing was called Won't You Come Home, Bill Bailey. She even signed her letters to everyone as the kid, which came from the famous outlaw Billy the Kid. She was young and vibrant and people loved to be around her. Her new boss, Chester Gillette was no different. Chester was a young man and in his twenties. He had worked at the factory that his family owned and was the boss of many young women. In those days, there was no sexual harassment laws on the books and dating his workers was fair game in his eyes. Eyes. After some eye contact, Chester set his eyes on the young, innocent, and naive Grace. She thought she had found the man of her dreams, but little did she know that he would become the evil in her nightmares. Chester began asking Grace to come to his home. People today may not see that as that strange, but in the early 1900s, this was a huge no-no for young women of the time. It was considered scandalous and would have ruined her ladylike reputation had the town found out. In those days, young men and women who wanted to date had to be chaperoned, even at the age of 18, as to not become pregnant before marriage. It sounds crazy, compared to today's standards, but had they followed the rules of the day, Perhaps she may have went on to live a happy, normal life, but sadly, that wasn't to be. Chester ended up getting his way, as he usually did. He considered himself to be quite the ladies' man. Whatever he wanted, he always got, which is a true sign of a narcissist. He didn't care about Grace's reputation, or the humiliation, that it would bring to her family if anyone found out, or if she became an unwed mother. He wanted what he wanted and he wouldn't let up until he got it, and in the end, he did. Grace became pregnant soon after. When she found out, Grace, instead of being shocked or saddened, was overjoyed. She was naive enough to think that Chester had actually loved her, and that he would do the right thing and marry her. That dream was crushed when he asked her to have an abortion. Grace, having grown up in a large family, loved and adored children. All she wanted in life was to become a wife and a mother and have her own family. Chester had no plans or intentions of becoming a father though. Grace went back to live with her mother, but all the while, continued to write Chester letters begging him, him to do the right thing by her and the baby. She wanted to become Mrs. Chester Gillette, but sadly, that dream would never become a reality. Her hopes was raised though when Chester came a calling and asked her to go on a romantic retreat on a lake at a huge and luxurious place called Big Moose Lodge. Her nerves were probably hopping with joy when he asked her to go rowing in a boat. She must have thought that he was finally going to propose to her and make her his wife. That's not what actually happened though. As they talked, Chester raised a tennis racket that was in the boat and hit her over the head with the blunt end knocking her from the boat. Grace and her unborn child both drowned. Chester had signed into the resort's guest book under a fictitious name, and he thought he would get away, but he was mistaken. Witnesses had seen them, and he was soon tracked down to a nearby motel. He at first claimed that he didn't know Grace, but when pressed, and after police found all of Grace's love letters in Gillette's belongings, he finally admitted that she was trying to get him to marry her, but he denied killing her. Evidence was on the side of Grace though. The trial of the murder of Grace Brown lasted three weeks. After hearing all of the evidence and the judge reading the letters to the jury, it was enough to send Chester Gillette to the electric chair. Crowds outside of the courthouse wanted to lynch him. As he was led in and out of the courthouse, threats were made by everyone, and he was even spat on by many. Chester Gillette had went from the young and handsome man that most everyone had liked, to one of the most hated men in all of America. 
On March 30, 1908, Chester asked to talk to his spiritual clergy, and finally admitted what he had done to poor Grace. None of the details were ever given to her family nor were they made public. That evening, they shaved his head and sat him in the chair, and soon sent over 18,000 volts of electricity through his body, ending his time here on Earth. It was his time to meet his maker, and to explain to a higher power why he had did what he did. In the years since, many have claimed to see the ghost of Grace Brown on the lake, and at the lodge where she stayed with Chester. Hopefully, someday her poor spirit will find peace and be able to move on. Till then, if you happen to be staying at the lodge, keep an eye out for the spirit of Grace Brown, a woman who died far too young, and before she ever got to live out any of her dreams, all because of a selfish, arrogant so-called man.